as is commonly believed in common perception energy storage systems are synonymous with battery technology though actually it may not be so but why they, why is this the common perception So thank you very much, uh, uh, leaders on the panel, for joining in. Thank you, leaders in the audience, and welcome to the Blue Circle. It's such a big privilege and a pleasure to reconnect with everyone, our distinguished panelists who are handpicked because of the think input that they bring in, and the rich experience as well. And thank you to our distinguished audience for joining us. We've received over 300 registrations, most of whom are CEOs, CXOs, and business heads. many of them are repeat visitors to our webinars which is very encouraging and motivates us to provide higher levels of dialogue through the online channels as well for those of you who are new with us today the blue circle is a network and ecosystem curated for business leaders to help them manage disruptive times and become future ready we focus on four fundamental sectors which are energy e mobility real estate and healthcare we also present social economic insights which ultimately determine the evolving complexion of the market in response to the covid challenge the blue circle has also accentuated its digital presence one of the many modes we employ is our weekly webinar series and our digital publication in addition to this and you will be happy to know that we are very soon launching an exclusive digital platform for leaders something like the linkedin for leaders wherein we will present the opportunity for them to connect with each other also house high quality curated content and meaningful conversations and business opportunities across these sectors those leaders who are interested please do write to us we've also begun our selective outreach as well and the topic for today's session is future of energy storage one of the big hindrances to man's search for a reliable economically competitive and environmental friendly a sustainable elect electricity system was the lack of an appropriate energy storage device have the recent advances in battery technology made us capable of reaching our goals we've invited prominent practitioners and thought leaders from the sector to discuss the emerging possibilities tailwinds headwinds and the way forward for energy storage in india in the best interest of time i will just quickly mention their respective names and designations we have with us mr kushagra nandan co-founder and president sun source energy mr peter duffy president of irish energy storage association mr prakash bvs managing director bharat energy storage technology dr rahul walawakar president and md customized energy solutions india ms vibhuti garg energy economist institute for energy economics and financial analysis and the chair and moderator for the session is mr pavan choudhury best selling author ceo of french multinational vigon india and sits on several boards across the country welcome sirs and ma'am to the panel and thank you again the audience for joining in kindly note that we will have q and a towards the end of the session and some of you already shared excellent questions there with the moderator now and now i request mr choudhury to please chair and moderate the session sir Well, thank you, Siddharth, and I have already weaved these questions in our talk track. So, let me first draw the circumference of this discussion. As is commonly believed in common perception, energy storage systems are synonymous with battery technology. though actually it may not be so but why they, why is this the common perception because the lithium ion battery has fallen in cost in the last 10 years by more than 80% 90% of the deployment of all energy storage systems is through lithium ion battery right now and 90% of the investment also in energy storage is going into lithium ion battery so which is why these two 
NAMES energy storage system and uh, lithium ion batteries have become almost synonymous, but this is a myth. So I will ask, first of all, BVS Prakash to chime in and tell us what is the scope of energy storage systems? What do they mean and what is the scope? Which are the various segments uh, or colors they exist in? Prakash. Thank you, Pavan. Uh, this energy storage, as you have been saying, has been more or less used like a synonym with batteries. And before we talk about the future, how long have we been using the batteries? About 200 years. And the rechargeable battery, probably some 20, 30 years later it had come. But all these days we have been using some sort of energy storage, whether we realized it or not. It's only in the recent past uh, where renewable energy has become a major player or come into greater acceptance uh, as a, a, you know, a sustainable energy source that we are talking about energy storage at large because this specific segment requires large support coming from uh, the storage to go forward. What is the scope for energy storage? I would say, well, as long as we continue to use the electricity, as long as we depend on electricity for our livelihood or day-to-day -day living, yes, energy storage has to be there and it's going to be there because any of the sources of energy that we are talking about will not hold, cannot be a, a sustainable one without a proper storage. Most of us have been talking about uh, the electric vehicles. Uh, that's what a common man or the industry at large sees, because that's where every, uh, the discussions are all centered around batteries, batteries, because they constitute probably some 40 or 45 percent of the total cost of an electric vehicle and the replacement and so on. So a, a very, very common understanding amongst all the people across, probably not, not just in India, but probably throughout the world is the electric vehicle segment. And then, of course, we're talking about uh, renewable solar energy or wind energy, which are, uh, you know, intermittent in terms of generation, which need some sort of a support to ensure uh, you know uh, the entire energy that is generated is properly utilized there is not too much of a stress on the grid and the grid balancing can be easily achieved and the grid can be optimally utilized going away in the mobility sector not just the electric cars or the two wheelers or the three wheelers or probably the buses that we have been discussing in India. There are so many more in the electric vehicle segment or the mobility segment. Let's just take the trucks, which nobody is really talking about in India. Let's talk about tractors, which nobody is talking about in India. Let's talk about Indian railways, probably where some 20,000 plus trains could be there as goods trains or passenger trains. Then let's talk about the ships, the number of ships that are there in India, as well as uh, globally, and not just for, uh, you know, the cargo. You have a lot of uh, smaller vessels like ferries or, you know, like cruises or the defense applications for Navy. I'm sure the overall count could be over 100,000 or 150,000. I don't have exact numbers. All of this have been contributing in a very big way to the challenge to the climate change that we are talking about. When we are trying to address, yes, we need a green earth, we need a clean earth. The global objective has been to fight the climate change. And these are all the villains when it comes to that particular challenge. How, how do we overcome that? Yes, we, all these things are mobile and probably all cannot be put on uh, you know, running through electricity the way we can run a train. So we need some sort of a storage device which can be incorporated or installed on the system and it can run through. Yeah. Now, going away from the mobility sector, uh, let's come to so many areas where uh, in, in you know, stationary applications. Uh, I, I have been reading some time back that Tata has signed about 
uh, with Rockefeller Foundation for setting up about 10,000 microgrids. What is the number that we're talking about? What is the opportunity or scope for energy storage in the segment? What are all the industrial applications that are there? One very small, this thing, when I was recently talking to a friend of mine from a bulk drug industry, he was mentioning that the process of cream coming out with a finished product in bulk drug, or you know, the churning or whatever it is, is around eight to 10 or 12 days, depending on the product that we are talking about. And they cannot afford power to go in for a moment because the whole thing goes bad and has to be discarded come to IT industry, which have come to data centers, which have been like guzzlers of power, and they are expected to grow multifold over a period of time. So that way, what is the scope? What is the future for en energy storage? It's yeah. just enormous. That, that's my initial reaction. Very good. So what you have said is energy storage is not a new thing. The battery is 200 year old. Also pumped hydro is very old. Exactly. Uh, so uh, and that is how you have tried to say that energy storage earlier also did not mean only battery. Pumped hydro was also energy storage. And you have said that there are mobile applications of energy storage and stationary applications. And in the mobile applications of energy storage also, battery alone is not enough because you have mobile ap application for ships, uh, for trucks, where you might need another form of energy storage like hydrogen. So you have alluded to the fact that there is an electrochemical type of energy storage, which is battery, but there is also chemical and mechanical and thermal, etc. Options. And you have also mentioned that in the stationary space, also there are various segments through uh, in which energy storage will apply. And all these segments will not be uh, cannot be catered only by batteries. Great points, Prakash. Great beginning. Let me come to Peter. Peter, can you tell us what are the goals of energy storage and what are the technologies available for energy storage? Peter. Very good. Um, good evening to everyone. It's uh, good morning here from Ireland, but it's good evening um, in India. But the uh, three the three goals that I would put down actually like for energy storage are the following. The primary goal is to balance energy supply and demand. And this is in the context, of course, like where we're moving towards renewable, intermittent and unpredictable energy sources. So, for example, like wind and solar and ocean. I think like I mean is that uh, the big drive into storage in the last few years is coming from the fact that we're moving across to renewables. If we could switch on and switch off the wind or the solar or indeed actually the ocean, there wouldn't be any great need. But because the wind will blow at times in excess and there will be at times when it doesn't blow. So therefore, in order to supply, to balance supply and demand, storage is going to be a major, uh, it's going to be a key element in going forward. So that's the first uh, goal that I would see. And I'll come back to that in a moment. The second goal then is related to national economies. In other words, to provide certainty to countries that their economies can develop and grow in a planned and orderly manner. In other words, having a state and a plan going forward. It's crucial actually that the overall economy can rely on that, as indeed, in fact, actually do citizens and inward investment because security of supply is very important. And the third goal relates, and I know it's been touched on briefly there by Mr. Pekash, it's to enable countries to achieve carbon neutral economies by 2050. So it's part of our overall mitigation of greenhouse gases. So as I said, the first one is balance energy, supply and demand. The second one relates, relates to the certainty for countries and their economies. And the third one is the overall saving the planet. But I do want to go back and just very briefly um, expand out on those slightly. 
In balancing supply and demand, there are three time frames that are crucial. The first actually is the first year. That relates primarily, like I mean, to We are losing you. Supply. Yeah. We, we, for we our, the second time frame is out to one day, and the third one then is out actually to perhaps uh, 14 days. Now, do you want me to move on to technologies there? No, I did not want to interrupt you. We were losing you. But yes, it will be great if we can go to technologies. Okay, if I move on to the technologies. If we're on the technologies, relate to different applications. So the first of those are what we call the short-term or rapid response. And they're going to be of interest to people today who are actually looking at microgrids. So for example, um, as, your, as the non-synchronous penetration, that means actually when wind and solar becomes more than 50%, then in fact, instability is going to come in. So if there's a major trip on the system, the, the system is at risk of going down fully. So something has to come in in order actually to provide the security and stability there for the system operator. And that is actually rapid response batteries, which are lithium ion. They could indeed actually be flywheels. They could be actually synchronous condensers. They could be ultra capacitors. So any one of those will come to the rescue of maintaining a stable and secure grid. And I would say in your audience today, for people who are looking at microgrids, this is a key factor. So in other words, when the, when the non-synchronous, that's renewable, when that becomes more than 50%, up to 60%, 70% and above, your system becomes quite uh, unstable or is at risk of becoming unstable. So you need to have actually those uh, supports there. And then I'll just move on then very quickly to what I call the medium and long term. And of course, as we know, like, I mean, you will have um, uh, lithium ion batteries are still very good up to about six hours. Flow batteries will come in largely after that. So if you want to store energy for more than six hours, certainly you will be looking at pump storage. And then you will also perhaps be looking at um, uh, compressed air. But for the longer term, and this is really the crucial one, for the longer term, the world and countries have to be thinking of perhaps green hydrogen. Because remember, if you want to go out for one, one day, seven days, 15 days, 20 days, we have to be thinking batteries will not do it, pump storage will not do it, or any of those technologies I referred to. So it's almost certain that we're looking at either green hydrogen or maybe green ammonia. But for the moment, I think it's green hydrogen that we would be looking at. Is that okay, Pavar? Yes, yes. I think you have summarized it, summarized it beautifully. The three goals uh, and also the technologies you've alluded to are chemical, like for example, hydrogen you spoke of, mechanical you spoke of pumped hydro and flywheels, Electrical is there, as you know, supercapacitors. Thermal you spoke of, and electrochemical is the battery. So these are the five buckets in which all the energy storage system technologies fit in, chemical, mechanical, ele electrical, and thermal. So great points made. Would you like to add something to this Kushagra? Because uh, Peter also spoke about microgrids and uh, you are a pioneer in this space. If Peter is the chairman of Irish Energy Association, we can say you are the uh, front runner of the microgrid uh, association of India, which may not have yet been formed, but you are already doing great work on that. Kushag. Kushag, can you repeat yeah. yourself? I think we are, we are losing, uh, we have lost uh, Kushag. So let me come to let me come to Rahul. Uh, yes, yes, you're, you're audible, uh, uh, Kushagr. Would you will you repeat yourself? Uh, am I audible now? Yes, you're audible. If you want, you can you can go on. You can stop your video so that we can hear you clearly uh, with uh, if there is a bandwidth issue. Sure, let me do that. Yeah, is it much better? Much right, better, great. much better. Great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, uh, first of all, thank you for the comments. 
and uh, uh, so I think it's a great point which you have made in terms of uh, uh, the microgrid part of it because as a country uh, we are still evolving. I, I'm afraid we cannot hear you. So Kushagr, we'll come back but, to you. Uh, on repowering uh, the islands uh, of which we are. Kushagr, we cannot hear you. So we are moving on now. We will move to Rahul. And Rahul, you can come in with uh, whatever you'd like to add to uh, this discussion on technologies uh, uh, around uh, energy storage systems. Rahul. Thank you, Pawan, and uh, thank you, uh, Peter and uh, uh, Prakash, for uh, your uh, opening remarks. Uh, so yes, so as a India Energy Storage Alliance, we see energy storage as a suit of technologies covering all forms of storage. And uh, in addition to technologies, what were mentioned by Peter and Prakash, we also include thermal storage, which is also a very dominant technology uh, uh, currently. And there you could have applications both on site where you can store uh, energy in form of a cold storage. Storage, uh, or you can use uh, even uh, uh, heat storage and use it to augment even thermal power plants or combine it with other forms of uh, storage technologies like compressed air energy storage. And apart from a lot of time when we talk about uh, energy storage, we focus on electricity storage. Uh, but actually, if you really want to achieve the goals what Peter mentioned in terms of the climate change and uh, uh, overall uh, climate reliability, then we need to start looking at role of storage in process industries and other applications. So overall, I think the canvas for energy storage technology is quite big and one of the things which I would like to highlight is a lot of times people when asked about this question about different technologies there is a um, unintended uh, uh, perception that there is a competition between just these storage technologies uh, but uh, our view is that actually all these storage technologies together can help us moving towards a cleaner and greener uh, uh, climate um, uh, in a faster pace uh, and it's not necessarily that these technologies like lithium-ion batteries versus hydrogen fuel cells they are competing with each other, but actually by looking at both the technologies, we can uh, electrify more of the transportation solutions in a shorter timeline. And then ultimately over next 10 years, the market will decide which technologies end up dominating or if there is a clear seg segregation between uh, different market segments where different technologies would come in. And Peter also made a one very good point that apart from right now, a lot of the discussion about storage technologies is for technologies which is storing energy for or uh, from minutes to maybe few hours. Uh, but if you are really moving towards the goal of getting 50% or even 100% renewables, as many of the countries or regions are talking about, that then we also need to start looking at uh, uh, seasonal storage. And there, hydrogen is definitely one of the solutions. But uh, we are actually quite excited that there are many other technologies like metal air technologies or liquid metal technologies or uh, electrothermal technologies, which are looking at now, especially focusing on beyond 10 hour kind of a storage and looking at price points, which are somewhere in like tens of dollars, uh, so below $50 per kilowatt hour, which has been sort of a barrier uh, where for last almost like 100, 150 year, around $90 was the price point where uh, lead acid batteries ended up stabilizing and further price reduction was not there. So there is a lot of investment happening on research to try to look at new materials, new forms of technologies uh, for uh, expanding this scope. Excellent point. So basic, I li love your expression, suite of technologies. Yes, energy storage systems represent a suite of technologies. And you have also alluded to the fact, adding to what Prakash said, that there are various segments and these segments have different needs. So energy storage systems should be ranked on various metrics. Mm -hmm. one, met one metric can be maturity. Whether the, uh, whether the technology has been stabilized, like for example, lithium ion or pumped hydro or not. Another could be efficiency. Third could be response time. Fourth could be the lifetime, which Peter also spoke of, and which is very important for energy storage system and utilities. Then the charging time and the environmental impact. So if we assess 
through these metrics various technologies we will understand that one technology will not do yeah. very well put rahul yeah just to add uh, to all the parameters you mentioned uh, one of the other parameter which is driving selection of technologies is energy density uh, and that that's area where actually there has been the reason uh, i think the poll ask about lithium ion batteries that is gaining attention is not just because of the price reduction but there are actually many applications like cell phones without the type of energy density which is uh, uh, possible with lithium ion batteries we wouldn't have had uh, smartphones at all so again uh, this is something which is very important to understand that as new technologies are coming in they are not necessarily going to compete with existing technologies for existing market but they are going to actually open up completely new segments and new markets like in terms of mobility things like drones or uh, 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 sort of a personal uh, aerial transportation this is something just maybe 5 or 10 years back it was just a fiction uh, but now with the kind of energy density which is possible with new forms of batteries getting commercialized over next 5 years that has become very much a possible reality and could open up a billion dollar opportunities for new businesses yeah energy density is a sub point of efficiency but it is very important and i'm glad that you brought up brought it up kushagra you were saying some something about microgrids uh, when we felt that your office also required some kind of microgridding stability <laughs> absolutely i think with a lot of internet bandwidth these days yeah. Uh, yeah. we really need to uh, up our all uh, internet bandwidth but anyways i think glad to be part of this session and appreciate uh, it so uh, uh, so i think the point of the microgrid part of it is uh, uh, i think the country as a as a whole is focusing and the government is really focusing repowering our islands especially both on the eastern side and the western side and uh, we fortunately are working on uh, projects in lakshadweep islands and in fact yesterday we have been awarded uh, interesting storage i think the first storage solar plus storage plus floating project in andaman uh, in north andaman in fact yesterday on a ppa so what is happening is in all these islands the uh, landed tariff uh, ended up ends up being somewhere around north of rupees 50 if you include the cost of transportation of diesel and uh, and maybe sometimes pilferage maybe there and uh, and uh, so but if you uh, look at even without any subsidies included uh, the solar plus storage makes economic sense today itself so we unfortunately we're deploying uh, multiple of these projects and on the mainland within the country we are have already deployed a few microgrids environment in places where uh, either the cost of energy is very high uh, in north of somewhere around 14 15 rupees in certain areas and plus there are blackouts or brownouts and in certain times of the uh, day the diesel generator is also on so it makes sense to put solar plus storage together and maybe integrate it with a diesel genset and with the utility to bring down the overall average cost of the power so there are multiple applications of those and these projects have been successfully running so opportunities are tremendous as rahul has, has mentioned and uh, i think as a country we are just getting ready uh, to open up these uh, major opportunities including in sector of microgrids yeah and your point regarding solar plus storage uh, being a very Uh, a competent substitute for diesel uh, generators is well well validated because of how the supreme court and the delhi government has moved banning right. diesel generators so it is not enough to have awareness and laws you also have to the, have the substitute technology only then the law works and then the relevant legislative authorities competent le- le- legislative authorities in this this case Uh, uh the delhi government uh, can move in so very good point coming back to peter peter what what do you think are the tailwinds which are the drivers of this energy storage uh, sector yes <clears throat> well i think actually that the tailwinds or what's driving it is i think the biggest driver uh, around the world is the need for climate action uh, to uh, tackle uh, the mitigation of greenhouse gases and most countries around the world uh, although maybe not Donald Trump but her uh, working in accordance with the paris accord so in other words what they're doing they're working towards the 2050 to decarbonize their economies so that is a huge driver but that comes down then to what sort of political leadership 
if the political leadership in your country or my country or any country and uh, is behind this drive and has a commitment from the top, um, then this, is, this can be a huge uh, tailwind in order actually to assist on storage. Because really it's about, as I said earlier, about balancing supply and demand from renewables. Government policies then have to be in place and government policies can even be uh, legislated. And you mentioned there a moment ago, like about, I think your Supreme Court uh, had a ruling regarding uh, diesel gens. So that's an important area. And also too, like I mean, is that if there's a change of government, if you have a new prime minister in a couple of years, as indeed we had Donald Trump who replaced Barack Obama. So what often happens, you get flip flopping. So you get a wonderful political drive from the top from one leader. Then there's an actually new leader comes in and that changes. So many countries are looking at that to see that they don't want that. They're looking to have a continuity. The third area that I would go on to then briefly is to say, like, I mean, a stable regulatory system where it's clear, like, I mean, actually, that the market is there, that the markets are open and that there aren't huge barriers. So that this makes actually a very attractive for uh, for inward investment. So you may have capital is very mobile now. So you may want to see investors coming in from overseas, not just within India's own economy, but coming actually from the outside world. Um, other areas like, I mean, of course, like, I mean, is that you would want to see actually the withdrawal of fossil fuel subsidies if they are there, because we do want to move away from fossil fuels. And also you perhaps would want to see, like, I mean, is that there is a carbon tax. A carbon tax really is to reflect or to capture the real cost, the real cost actually like of the environmental damage that's been done arising from the fossil fuels. And just the last two points in this area would be the reducing cost of technology. And I know Rahul uh, has referred to that uh, in his um, in the past few minutes, improving technology through uh, research and development. There is wonderful. I think India has wonderful universities, has a very high level of education system. And it's great to see the universities engaging with industry in research, because this will have an impact then of bringing on new technologies and improve. And the last one then actually like is that mobility is capital, that the mobility of capital. So Pavan, these are my comments there. Great points, great points uh, to kick Hello? off this round. Uh, great points to kick off this round, uh, uh, Peter. Let me come to Vibhuti. Vibhuti, you study the this space from the energy and uh, finance interface. So I would like to understand from you, what are your comments on the tailwinds from the socio-economic lens? Um, thanks, Mr. Chaudhary. Um, we have, as we've kind of talked about, you know, the storage technologies are ranging uh, from good old days from pumped hydro, to lead acid batteries and now lithium ion batteries and even hydrogen fuel cell. So while the pumped hydro system existed for long, you know, but given the geographical limitations of suitable pump storage sites and new large scale reservoir, attention is now turning to other options in a very rightly manner. And as Rahul pointed out, it's not about these uh, technologies or these, uh, they are competing amongst themselves, but there are different options and can be used in different system. So from uh, economic and social point of view, you know, uh, firstly, I think uh, the biggest driver uh, for going ahead with these storage technologies, specifically the battery storage technology, is the falling cost. As uh, many of you have already talked about how the costs have gone down drastically from 2010 10 onwards, you know, approximately by 87 percent um, and which is further likely to go down in the next four to five years and we are expecting that the prices would reach somewhere about 90 to 100 us dollars per kilowatt hour which will make uh, this system of using renewable energy plus storage for grid stabilization or for you know other uh, things which we've already been talked about and, you know, as a more firm power uh, in the next few years. Further, I would say that, you know, um, storage helps in kind of uh, providing arbitrage opportunities. So 
when i say arbitrage you know uh, basically the storage system along with re would allow uh the system uh in absorbing electricity from the grid at times when power prices are low and selling this electricity back into the grid when prices are higher uh especially in cases where time of day tariffs are applicable this definitely would make much more sense and it would lead to electricity prices um uh, going down and also help the overall system operations and reliability thirdly i would say if you compare uh, the cost now with the retail tariff of especially the commercial and industrial consumers uh, now you know uh, which are much higher of uh, like around ranging from 8 rupees to 12 rupees per kilowatt hour for most of these commercial and industrial consumers across various states in india but if you look at the cost of re plus storage uh, you know for say for example a 250 kilowatt of energy storage system with a backup of 4 hours or even you know a 25 megawatt solar system with 4 hour battery backup it's somewhere between uh, 6 and a half to 7 rupees per kilowatt hour as i said which is much lower uh, than uh, the retail tariff for these commercial and industrial consumers so it kind of is an incentive for them to uh, shift to more economical system and most of these consumers are also using diesel sense sets especially during peak hours and the price is much much higher of you know 13 which is ranging from 13 to 17 rupees per kilowatt hour so if you make this comparison then uh, you know uh, the the viability for these consumers is already there it is for other consumers for whom uh retail consumers like us you know who are getting a uh, subsidized tariff for them it's still some time to go when uh, the cost as we are expecting to go down for both re as well as these uh, energy storage cost to go down and for them to become more viable and lastly i would say you know this storage um, has been able to provide uh, ancillary services when i say ancillary services you know it basically you know uh, the ability for uh, these technologies to provide uh, or to address the imbalances between supply and demand and maintain grid frequency at all time interval so uh, to provide such gen- uh, services you know the generators have to respond fairly quickly to signals and to help the frequency fluctuation storage system which has high flexibility can provide an accurate services to grid operators um we have already talked about uh, the examples of delhi and even haryana where i am located now we uh, we have seen graded response action plans being imposed and you know wherein the dg uh, sets cannot run any longer so during these times you know if we had storage systems available you know we have been been able to uh provide a better solution uh in such scenarios also very recently you know we have seen a blackout in maharashtra and uh, mumbai specifically uh where again you know these storage solutions would have helped the system operator to maintain the grid frequency and avoid the blackouts so these are some of the you know uh from economics and commercial perspective why storage is kind of gaining prominence now great points so you have spoken about consumer cost coming down that is one tailwind falling cost of production is another tailwind and falling cost of uh, production along with rd and d research demonstration and design if the technology there are several technologies like lithium ion or sodium sulfur or hydrogen etc they have been able to prove that they are ready to be commercialized Uh, through research design or uh, demonstration and design and the last point which you spoke about was also mentioned by both was alluded by alluded to by rahul and peter which was stacking you are talking about arbitrage you are talking about ancillary services you are talking perhaps about the fact that those storage systems should be allowed for a versatile operation that means backup transmission into the grid etc so that they are not limited uh, tomorrow because of policy or architecture uh, that they are lying unused for long times so as long as 
those those uh, architectures allow for good upkeep of battery uh, or storage system then uh, these stacking of services should be done great points moving on to prakash uh, back to prakash prakash what would you like to add to the tailwind please bhavan uh, few years back when i got into this line and uh, when i started talking to people that energy is going to be stored in phase change materials by way of heat the thermal energy storage people did not understand there is a big change that has come up in the last few years for people start understanding what is energy what is energy storage this wasn't there in the past and this has been driven primarily by more than one reasons as uh, rahul said vibhuti was saying the cost of energy generation or electricity generation through dg sets has been abnormally high not talking about the maintenance and the pilferage charges that uh, challenges that are always there with them so and if you take an it company or somewhere there there are several instances where 100% dg backups are being provided to ensure there are no blackouts or the failure of uh, you know systems now there has been a conscious move at global level towards a greener earth to replace the fossil fuels that has percolated from the top so and so on to into the country levels where politi- i know uh, political leaderships have also been talking about a green earth and so on when it comes to india particularly beyond all this has been an effort by the government to provide electricity across to every citizen and every home across the country uh, there has been a serious drive a few years for 5 6 years back to electrify each and every village and there was a portal where we could see how many villages have been electrified in the last 3 months or how many more are pending and so on so that way they, they, there was a serious effort to make electricity available to every household in the country now the existing generation that was happening from either uh, hydel or uh, coal based or gas based plants have many many challenges let's say talking about hydel if you come into south india like uh, pro- probably place in andhra pradesh or uh, tamil nadu two to three months in a year there is almost all the hydel plants are literally shut because there is no water to run them same is the challenge with the uh, uh, the coal based plant because water availability is a must there so these sort of challenges have been hindering whereby government started looking at going for renewable energy in a very big way peter let me just uh, bring to your notice about four or five years back i'm not very sure of the date first time when solar prices were given or uh, projects were awarded the cost per kilowatt hour was something around 18 rupees uh, in today's rate about 25 or 27 cents probably so from there we have moved forward to where it has now fallen to less than a sixth of what it was earlier so this price fall in the renewable energy has prompted many more to ad- adopt to that system as a source of electricity for individual consumptions at industrial or uh, commercial this thing now what is happening is this intermittent nature of both the, the solar and the wind have their own uh, you know uh, challenges in ensuring energy security and 24 by 7 availability of electricity for each of any of them and that's how the prominence for energy storage has stepped in in a very very big way governments have recognized industry has recognized and i even spoke to one uh, a one of the uh, de- developer of a gated community in hyderabad a few weeks back few weeks back where he was saying that he would like to integrate energy generation like solar uh, power plants on each of the roofs of the uh, villas that he was talking have with a solid the robust energy storage to ensure that the dependence on grid is minimal and clean energy is there across the community so that way there has been overall move from different segments going forward to accept the energy storage as a viable solution amalich great points so all three of you if i was to summarize you have mentioned these are the main drivers climate action ecological driver economic driver which vibhuti highlighted equity is another thing which 
Prakash just brought in. Edison said that we will make electricity so cheap that only the rich will have will be lighting candles. But that dream has not yet materialized for one billion people. One billion people are not connected with electricity still. One billion people still do not know that there can be safety in the nights or in the evenings for women to commute around in their uh, localities through electricity or there can be educational uh, push through electricity by utilizing the evening time. So equity is another thing. In another separate discussion, Rahul spoke about capacity. Uh, capacity, the actually the consumption is going to increase so much that we will need greater capacity and energy storage systems will tomorrow also add to the capacity by allowing for uh, more prudent expenditures in the overall energy system. Democratization, people want their own control, security, Military establishments are asking for it. Remote places like Andaman, Nicobar uh, are asking for it. And of course, the performance and cost piece. Very well put. Uh, so coming to the headwinds, and let me start this piece with Rahul. What are the headwinds, Rahul, and what are the way forward? What is the way forward? So, uh, before I talk about headwinds, I would just like to say that I think we are entering a decade of uh, energy storage now. So, I think uh, although I'll highlight some of the things which have delayed maybe some of the progress in last few years, but I don't think most of these issues will stand and uh, we'll see rapid growth in um, the coming decade. Uh, so, to start with, I think uh, one of the issues has been the regulatory and policy structure. And it's not that regulators have been trying to block storage. In fact, uh, I've been uh, personally working since 2013 very closely with all the state and central government regulators and in general they are very proactive and they are actually quite excited about storage technologies it just that there are so many places where regulations block entry of new technologies because while they were writing the regulations they were only looking at existing technologies and so you have to keep on going and identifying each place and try to diligently uh, make uh, make a way for uh, allowing storage to play uh, so over the last six years we have achieved many breakthroughs but still at Central Electricity Regulatory Commission, which is a nodal agency, uh, unfortunately, with all the new ideas coming up with electricity markets and other things, uh, in terms of their priorities, uh, there are a number of uh, uh, rules and regulations uh, where uh, we are still waiting for the final signature from the uh, chairman. Uh, and hopefully before uh, the chairman gets transferred, uh, uh, I think we should get it. Otherwise, we have to start the process again from start. Like I have been doing this for now. This is the third CRC chairman where I have gone through the entire process of providing all the information, supporting documentation and other things. Uh, so that is the biggest challenge where uh, uh, unless we get a decision before the bureaucrat gets transferred, uh, you have to start from scratch because there is no continuity in terms of this type of decision making or positions where with the IA structure, although these are all very brilliant people, but they get transferred from any department to any department and obviously before they can put their name onto any key decision, they have to get convinced. Um, the other side is maybe I would put on the industry side in terms of the manufacturing, uh, because this is an area where uh, maybe over the last two, three decades, India, uh, Indian industry has maybe lost a little bit of a confidence. And there is a tendency where many companies want to just rely on assembling or uh, just implementing projects rather than looking at where India can actually become a manufacturing hub. So as a India Energy Storage Alliance, we have started this initiative in 2016, where we have set a vision that we don't want India to just to become a big market for storage, but we also want India to become a global hub for R&D and manufacturing. Uh, but that's a part where we are uh, severely lacking the capability, not in terms of the skilled manpower or engineers, but maybe on the management and the uh, business owners in terms of taking the decision or taking the risk for identifying and investing in some of the breakthrough technologies instead of just waiting for these technologies to get commercialized and then uh, partnering with one of the international companies to set up a factory. So that's something which we need to get through uh, if India really needs to become a global player in this. And the last thing I would say actually the same uh, point which was raised as a tailwind in terms of the cost reduction potential and improvement which is happening because it is very easy that makes it very easy for 
for people to procrastinate and just say that okay i'll wait for another 2 years or 3 years uh, one of the former uh, energy ministers uh, throughout 3 years of his tenure kept on asking we lost you rahul although I it is a great thing is opening up new uh, uh we we lost you on the mini- we lost you in the ministry okay. piece maybe he is the minister of telecommunication uh, <laughs> yes yeah, the portfolio keeps on changing so maybe yeah <laughs> so uh, yeah so uh, i'll move on to the next point but i think uh, this is something where although with the cost reduction which is happening uh, uh, there is a tendency where people think that if we delay it by another year i am going to get better deal and what people are mostly missing is and again i uh, i congratulate kushagra for the project which he is going to do uh, but this is something which should have happened 5 years back actually back in 2012 2013 we had submitted all the studies and analysis to show that india should be focusing on these island projects and uh, solarize them with batteries to try to uh, reduce the uh, emissions and actually even consumption of diesel where even like 5 years back these projects were economical at the price point at which storage was there 3 years mm-hmm. back when uh, ntpc and uh, many of the other agencies did series of uh, proposals the cost for solar plus storage was 50% of the cost which they are paying they were paying at that time and instead of taking the decision they ended up saying like oh we want to still wait for cost to fall down further and in last 3 years probably they have already paid more on the diesel consumption than what they would have paid for the storage system so these are the type of things where i think we need little bit uh, visionary and uh, uh, decisive of uh, bureaucrats and decision makers and to some extent actually as a industry we need to start holding some of these bureaucrats accountable because one challenge is that a lot of time these bureaucrats are worried about that if they take a wrong decision they will get blamed and uh, uh, they want to play it safe but no one basically holds them accountable if during their tenure uh, uh, decisions don't get uh, made and that delays the progress and they still get on moved on to the next position and then again the circle keeps on continuing so these are some of the things if we okay. change i'm pretty sure uh, in next 5 years india can become a major hub in this area okay so uh, very good points awareness you mentioned and uh, prakash also mentioned that awareness itself is low about this sector among the various stakeholders and surely the bureaucrats also and what, there was one legitimate reason also for the awareness to be low that renewables had not come into the picture in such a compelling manner when the renewable intermittency comes into uh, the picture then the energy storage system uh, stationary energy storage system comes into picture in a very big manner so uh, surely uh, this is just to just to say it from their side yeah, you have some point to, uh, to make no, but but, just, but i agree with you broadly yeah. yeah no but just actually i want to get away from this notion because then i think the uh, sort of benchmark keeps on changing right then people say oh we can easily adopt right now 10% renewables when we cross 20% or when we cross 50% then we look at it actually storage is essential for optimizing the grid the way peter mentioned even right now because right now we are building transmission lines many of these transmission lines are getting utilized hardly 10 to 20% capacity utilization since that capital cost gets sort of a socialized across all the consumers no one realizes how much money wastage is happening in that area but instead of doing that if you start actually figuring out how you can optimize or in places where they are not building transmission to the right capacity we have severe curtailment happening for solar and wind and then we are wasting all that energy so there are things where it is not only about renewables i think with renewable definitely there are opportunities uh, but we have had projects one of the first energy storage project uh, uh, in uh, developed countries uh, was done by aes where they actually integrated uh, batteries with coal plant because they found out that the way the coal plant was getting operated or the way the coal plant was required to operate uh, below its economical point to provide ancillary services to the grid they could actually make more money sell more t- energy from by combining storage and addressing that so there are things where we need to look at storage not just related to renewables uh, but also how it can help the overall uh, uh, efficiency of the grid and optimize the investment yeah i share your angst for uh, about the bureaucracy i was just wanting that the absence should not be unrepresented point number 1 and the uh, and the discussion becomes more comprehensive and let me also bring a point from california 
in california they moved very fast the bureaucracy moved very fast and asked for uh, implementation and uh, acquisition of energy storage systems deployment within uh, a year or two and later on they were blamed that you have brought in this one or two year period and one year period and that has made the whole thing lopsidedly favoring the battery lithium ion battery technology you should have given it more time this is just a counterpoint okay but i do agree with what you are saying and i also feel that bureaucrats bureaucrats are not thorough and they are not good at allocating resources in fact i uh, i only admire one uh, uh, politician uh, for this thoroughness and that is margaret thatcher margaret thatcher was a chemist uh, by profession and then also a lawyer and she was very thorough so thorough that she was called forensic and she loved this moniker forensic uh, she was uh, so thorough that her main guy in the chief of policy uh, a guy called geet joseph was only responsible for suggesting unintended adverse consequences which will come from the policy which she is planning and uh, so but usually politicians and bureaucrats are not thorough and they are also as you said rightly that they do not have stable tenures and we might need stable technocrats and thirdly you also said that it is possible that they are looking at the next uh, at this whole piece of not taking decision as a way to save themselves from any fallout and because of which also they might might procrastinate so these are some of the headwinds great points uh, rahul kushagra i would like you to add to this the headwinds and the way forward i think the headwinds are already there i agree with rahul the next decade is going to be of uh, storage and uh, i think as a country we are making the right progress but it can be more faster uh from a deployability perspective uh because our uh, transmission lines are uh our assets uh, are getting underutilized in fact uh there is a lot of uh, value add services uh, which can be offered from the existing solar plants by offering uh, storage in them and in fact the new open access markets which are opening across uh, the country if we club it with solar plus storage it will open up uh, not only from a perspective of discoms or uh, transmission corporations where they are have to plan new substations or have to increase the substation capacities if they uh, or, uh, install more storage over there so their capex defer capex deferments may happen and uh, the load congestions can be smoothened out so uh, there are many opportunities i think which we going to f- find out and have over the next decade but uh, we're starting uh, but i think uh, more uh, uh, policies have to be formed so that the deployability can be fast tracked okay great great points other comments on headwinds and way forward vibhuti and then i'll come to prakash and then finally to peter um i would say uh, in terms of headwinds um, one more aspect is access to low cost capital is missing so if finances uh, you know or the government can direct financial institutions and banks to provide low cost financing to upcoming uh, storage projects this would further help in reduction in tariff and you know improve project viability so um i uh, the low cost capital would play a critical role here uh in terms of other things uh, uh, as part of way forward you know um we have seen um seki coming up with tenders of hybrid technologies as well as rtc tenders so we do hope that the government uh, you know continues with uh, these kind of tenders instead of coming up with plain <laughs> vanilla solar or wind contracts uh and uh, we have seen very successful kind of price formations in both these round the clock or whether re with storage you know where green co Uh, has provided an off peak tariff of rupees 2.88 per kilowatt hour with peak tariff of uh, you know rupees 6.12 per kilowatt hour which is and they are primarily on a use pumped hydro storage whereas renew power uh, with the same off peak tariff and peak tariff of 6.85 rupees per kilowatt hour is going will be using largely the battery storage 
so the prices are very much in range and uh, as i said you know such government initiatives of coming up with these kind of bids will really boost uh, the storage technologies great point vibhuti and i feel your point regarding finance mm-hmm. options uh, not only cost of finance but also the various models of financing that is very important because many a time this investment is really highly capital intensive and uh, many industries have been at this juncture where they are just getting born and they are very expensive to invest in aviation is one of them airbus and boeing would not have been so successful if they had not found out ways to finance their purchases by the airlines so i think we are also at that uh, juncture as far as energy storage system is concerned very good point prakash what would you like to add to that kavan i was just uh, thinking about what rahul was saying about the decision needs to be taken instead of waiting for a new technology to come or a cheaper technology to come that reminded me i'm uh, sorry for uh, off tracking the discussion my grandmother used to tell a complaint on her mother in law but they had a big basket of mangoes in the season at the house so she would open all of that and look for the spoiled ones and get start eating saying that the good ones we can eat tomorrow so the next day morning when she opens up again there are some more rotten ones only she will take that out so are we going to look at a phase where we will be trying to nourish ourselves with some rotten fruit or are we looking to go for a fresh fruit which is nutritious and is going to sustain and help us in overcoming all the challenges and that that is a mindset that the industry at large government at large has to adopt probably industry also has to look at uh, uh, different business models to be brought inside because each and every industry or let's the way i was mentioning about a uh, gated community they may not be in a position to afford investment for a solar cum storage or some sort of solution to move to a more sustainable greener solution so there is enough room for all such opportunities uh, to bring in and i think the whole situation has to be that people have to look at uh, very very positively and not going just by the cost considerations uh, i'll just give you one more small example 6 7 years back while i was consulting for corporate social responsibility i was talking to a few people to go for rooftop solar solar projects which were of some of 170000 or so with some 20 30% uh, subsidy so they used to calculate oh 125000 1% a month my electricity bill is only 300 rupees my at 1% i'll be paying 1000 rupees a month so these mindsets have to be set aside but of course i forget about a smaller house but the industry per se has to look at it more realistically what is the opportunity cost what is the opportunity profit going forward what is the cost for which we are contributing governments also need to create a greater awareness of course bodies like iesa headed by rahul have been doing a fantastic job uh, holding meetings in different cities uh, trying to impress upon the local industry yes here is energy storage here it has come to stay and this is a big relief that you are going to get when you switch into renewables supported by solar i know storage solutions great point great point prakash and i fully agree with uh, what you and uh, rahul are saying uh, and uh, to make the make, make the discussion even more complete let me just try to uh, say respond to what he said and i fully agree with that manufacturing and r&d both the energy sector is an adapter it is not an innovator of uh, energy storage systems also you see they are coming from other sectors from automotive etc so we should uh, not only have manufacturing here but also r and d and the other point which you brought about is very important opportunity cost and at the same time so that the absent are not unrepresented let me tell you how the bureaucrat thinks and i would not really Uh, uh empathize with him but this is how he thinks he also thinks about the sunk cost what is the sunk cost in uh, coal power and how will it be affected if we move into the renewable side and 
there is a coal power lobby also so these are also points which he he weighs and which is why we advise to the bureaucracy that go for inclusive innovation like when the dew ponds of the world were being asked to phase out chlorofluorocarbons the american government also told them that the substitutes which are discovered should be discovered in your laboratories and we will fund those researches so that whatever you lose because of change in technology you gain through the new technologies which are coming in so but the bureaucrat is frankly speaking not so thorough he is not so informed and uh, also we say we, for example for electric vehicles we have said that do not call them electric vehicles do not make a policy based on electric vehicles make a clean vehicle policy that will allow the hybrids also to come in the plug in hybrids also to come in and existing players will not oppose forthcoming technologies but for this you have to do very wide research and i was and rahul was telling me and i fully agree with that that other than the prime minister perhaps hardly any bureaucrat <laughs> has that width and depth of understanding so i fully agree with you and which is why uh, i endorse what both of you say and uh, uh, another gentleman who was on our panel recently mr gurcharan das gurcharan said that um, he has written a book called india grows at night he is as you know a how howard alumnus a ceo of procter and gamble ex ceo and a famous author he has written a book called india grows at night and i asked him what is the reason for this title he says i have written india grows at night because in the night the government is sleeping okay so yeah. so which is where we which is where we are i fully agree with you this is a big headwind uh, peter uh, just uh... since you quoted me on uh, this i just would like to make at least one exception uh, i think what work which uh, niti ayog and particularly mr amitab kant has been doing uh, i think we really appreciate and probably he is uh, one good exception there were others obviously again uh, we are just generalizing too much but uh, uh, he is maybe one uh, uh, bureaucrat who has really taken this uh, by its horn and although he has a lot of responsibilities across different sectors but particularly i think some of the things which are happening and the new Fifty gigawatt hour manufacturing mission, which is being, uh, uh, which is expected to get announced any day now as part of the production link incentive. I think without Mr. Khan, that wouldn't have happened. So, uh, although I was one of the principal authors of the national energy storage mission for Eminari, uh, probably at Eminari we didn't have the kind of drive what uh, Mr. Amitabh Khan and Niti Aayog team had shown in last couple of years. So, although we lost maybe a year uh, because of this sort of restarting the work, but uh, we are very happy with the work which Niti Aayog. team has done and we hope that there are no more hurdles and uh, uh, this mission really gets launched uh, within next week or two so that we can really get started with uh, looking at building manufacturing base in india could could be and if that is true i compliment him and niti ayo having said that uh, the investors i meet many a time they ask me who's your ambassador for make in india who's that bureaucrat who will not as i was sharing with you uh, behave with me in a feudalistic manner who i can call up and i can get that reception which which an investor wants earlier it was okay that that the marshal man and the bureaucrat had all the power generals they were plundering bureaucrats were administering and distributing they had all the power which is reflective of what napoleon said uh, pointing towards U- uk let us defeat this nation of shopkeepers that means shopkeepers or businessmen were seen as something low but now it is not so all over the world the economic man has come on the same table and he is wa- asking for uh, egalitarianism so are the bureaucrats today providing that egalitarian behavior Uh, to the uh, uh, to the businessman are they really welcoming him and giving him an equal position or are they taking small points and drawing big offense and and then uh, you know uh, that that also has to be seen so now i'm come coming on the other side that i 
once again endorse your earlier position and prakash's position that this is a very big headwind surely coming back to peter peter uh, please share with you with us your opinion of the uh, hurdles and the way forward okay. and then we will have one or two questions okay and pavan is it okay if i just pick up firstly on a few points that were raised and just to add to them um yeah. i like very much mainly what uh, prakash and also particularly what uh, rahul has said there regarding network planning and that means like both of the transmission network and the distribution network storage should be seen as an element as a an important element in there so in other words in terms of um postponing uh, network upgrades and costly upgrades which may not be needed so for example is there is a surplus of uh, power at certain times then it would be important like to have a uh, storage there that can absorb that and then if there's a shortfall at other times then the storage actually uh, injects it back into the system and this is this uh, point has been looked at actually in many countries that it's an integral part of the thinking when they're looking at both network planning or distribution or transmission uh, regarding the area like i mean of uh, solar and storage and co-location i think that's actually something that's been looked at in every country and i think it's it's i'm delighted to hear that that that's actually now been looked at in india because it makes sense actually like i mean is that to in order uh, to utilize all and capture all of that energy that's coming actually from your solar farms or your wind farms or whatever it's important in fact actually that that's not wasted so we should be utilizing storage for that another point that i just like to refer to is this area like where does india see that it can be a leader as in context in as in uh, contrast to being a follower um one of the speakers there referred to maybe looking at uh, microgrids islands and so on this could be an area like where india says look we want actually to be shown that we are actually the best at this and we are leaders in this it's actually regarded i think that china were the people who took the solar panels and they reduced the cost dramatically but so i think that india as a big economy has the scope there to say listen storage we're not just going to utilize storage but we are going to be actually a leader in world storage technology and get out at the front and with our r&d and so on couple of, couple of other small points are i think your own association the indian energy storage association can influence can have a big influence for the political leaders because i think political leaders have a huge role to play if it's seen that they are actually behind this and they ensure like i mean that there's a regulatory uh, system in place good market opening no major barriers and all of that The second last point I'd make on that then is that to see and I know that this is coming through in your talk today to see that um storage is much wider than batteries and to go for a uh, see it as a much uh, broader portfolio of technologies and I know like I mean you've referred to those in particular like pump hydro and you've also referred of course to hydrogen in the latter and my very last thing then about is that this whole issue of security of supply excuse me i think that's going to become more important in the future if you're looking to major inward investment and i'm talking about the indian um economy if they're looking to major inward investment i think security of supply is a big thing and i think that's an area where I've, and i've mentioned earlier like where and one of your the lady your lady speaker there mentioned that storage can add those ancillary services that can contribute of course to a uh, good grid stability and this is an important area excellent um, very well summarized so so is, I, yeah. yeah very well summarized come back and pick up on those these were important points i think that were raised and just to add to them and i hope that's okay with you go ahead go ahead can i then um did you want me then to add one or two other points then in regard to for example some of the headwinds that may be actually coming down this go 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 ahead well if, i've if, touched on them earlier 
I do any, think actually that if failure, if any headwind is not oh, covered, sorry, my, would, if any headwind, no, I don't no, they're actually covered. No, the, I think they're covered. Okay, like that's fine. Sorry, yeah. Okay, okay back okay. to yourself, Pavan. I hope I have not Thank interrupted you. you. So no, that's all right. I, I think you have beautifully summarized. And if I was to collect all the thoughts coming from Prakash, uh, Vibhuti, Rahul, and Kushag, and you, what you are all saying is, uh, we need uh, going forward. We need a, to develop a supportive policy and market frameworks for ESS or energy storage system, which is formed through a shared understanding and mm -hmm. same level of information, at least on working level of information by various stakeholders, including policymakers, you, uh, the providers, the consumers, etc. The second point you're saying is the market design and access uh, uh, should be well done, which Vibhuti also brought out, that so that the energy storage system is well utilized and does not stay idle. Third point which you have made is this whole energy storage system should be technologically agnostic and it is far more than batteries. And for new technologies to come, there should be RD&D, &D, research, demonstration and design. And the fourth point which you have made is regarding the investment piece. Investors will be attracted to this sector when these technologies mature, go through our d, &D as well as the adoption of these of energy storage system by utilities, governments, etc. will be facilitated when we have when we bring out certain financial options and models for them to be able to capitalize these purchases. Great points. And really thorough discussion and uh, uh, I'm sure the audience, uh, if I look at the number of questions which I have received on my WhatsApp as well as uh, on, the, uh, on the data uh, on the chat are huge. Most of them are talking about future trends uh, and, and where, would, where would you bet your dollar, etc. For this, we will have to come to a subsequent, uh, on a subsequent occasion, we'll have to come together or bring some other panelists to discuss uh, these questions, as there is, they, they will require a deep dive. Uh, I take out two questions, uh, one for Kushag, and uh, uh, the other I'll decide. So Kushag, or the next one for Rahul. So Kushag, how do we reach all the remote villages in India for renewable plus, plus storage, for off-grid connectivity, Will the electricity board and distribution agency in the state encourage this? So it's a it's a good question, I think, uh, and uh, very powerful question. I think uh, if we have a state, I think it goes back to stable uh, bureaucracy in place who can understand the data behind implementing storage solutions at the distribution level. Uh, even at the transformer level and uh, clubbing the storage solution either at the substation or at the transformer level. So it will do, uh, it will definitely defer their capex perspective. Plus it will also strengthen the grid uh, at the end user perspective. So I think it all, it, what all is required is a stable policy uh, for, for that matter. Uh, storage is something which will definitely uh, provide uh, much better connectivity at the last mile. It will provide much better access as we are already seeing, for example, this island which we are working in out of the four islands in Lakshadweep, one island till date does not even have electricity. So the transmission is there, the generator is not working. So for example, over there, we are repowering everything over there. So it is bringing the real impact in terms of uh, uh, the lives of the people and we are doing it with solar and storage. So we are basically practicing as we are, uh, as we are saying and this design is just getting approved and we will be implementing it. And what it required was a leadership at the SECI level, leadership at the central government level, although it took time, but it is happening. I think the same leadership is required at the discoms level, at the state level to make it happen. I think if it happens, then it will open up a much broader market 
and eventually the ripple effects will be in prospective or it will boost the manufacturing it will provide lot of jobs to the engineers to uh, to uh, the unskilled laborers who will be implementing it to the people who will be maintaining it so it will open up a much more broader marketplace and which is required and to and will open up lot of job market in the country as well so you are finding already the central government to be extremely receptive yes. you hope that this receptivity and awareness will percolate down to the state governments and to the district governments also uh, district authorities also distribution yep. boards great great point and uh, lastly i'll ask rahul rahul what is the role of ai in big data uh, ai and big data in energy storage oh, and actually i'm having some problem with my audio i'm not able to hear you uh, Ro- role of ai i uh, lost my speaker can you can you just close your uh, video put off your video maybe then you can hear me can you hear me rahul i think he's uh, i think we cannot reach him so peter would you like to take that the role of big data and artificial intel- intelligence in energy storage design well i'm not an expert in our in uh, this area but one of the the uh, my answer would be the following uh, data is regarded across all industries as nearly the new oil so data is hugely important our ability to collect data is enormous um in every industry so it's important actually that 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 data is collected and then fed back into the uh, research uh design development demonstration and i think actually it's going to have a, an increasingly bigger role in the future now big data has an important role um or in every industry but certainly in the storage industry in in now i know mr prakash actually said earlier like of course like we've had the battery going back a couple of hundred years but and and in the last maybe 60 years we've had a lot of pump storage but a lot of the other technologies are relatively new in other words like i mean is that will we be going for for example uh, a greater design of flywheels um or perhaps uh, ultra capacitors will we also maybe be looking at uh, more in terms of hydrogen and what type and terms then actually of transport in terms of heavy duty transport the electric cars and so on so in short what i'm saying is i think big data is going to have a huge role to play and that will feed back into largely into the universities where you're going to have um research development demonstration design and so on so an increasingly bigger role in the future i would say yeah very right so big data ai iot will help us get weather patterns nearby grid congestion uh, electricity rates Uh, load behavior of buildings load behavior of condos load behavior of communities so all this will be available to us through ai iot big data and that will help us uh, design uh, energy storage systems which are uh, let me say very thorough and which uh, really are extremely efficient uh, and uh, uh, they 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 work uh, uh, work work for the dollar which we spend on them so great points uh, yeah kushag you would like to add something yeah this only point i would like to add over there is on the big data part as a country is moving towards time of day use pattern as for example you have mentioned about the california example uh, similarly a lot of states have already moved or they starting to move towards time of day pat- use pattern so what we are seeing is understanding at what time it makes sense to have so- storage because at the end of the day it comes with a cost associated and at uh, at 15 minute minute interval data which we can generally now have uh, uh, for, for the uh, usage so once we understand that data once once we can dissect that data and, and then provide a solution around it it makes uh, lo- uh, it makes the system more optimized and i think the data is becoming more crucial and understanding the data becomes even more crucial in uh, in optimizing the solution around it i think uh, and as a country starts moving and uh, towards time of day use it will become even more crucial uh, from that perspective yeah and since 70% of the deployment will be solar which is where the efficiency changes during overcast days not only efficiency 
when the demand is uh, when, uh, when the supply is very good during uh, during the afternoon many a time the farmer doesn't want to use his pump set during that time because at that time evaporation is also very high so all this data can be captured very well uh, for uh, ideal use uh, for uh, designing the energy storage system uh, i think rahul is back with us let us give him 30 seconds last comment on this rahul any any comments on use of ai mm -hmm. iot big data in the design of energy storage systems Then can I just while I, while you're waiting for Rahul, can I just add in there that smart yes, grid yes, systems? Yes, please, please add, and then we will close. I think we are. Yes, un smart grid systems around the world actually are attracting huge interest. Where all of this data has been coming in, and where the the grid and the network actually is operating in a more efficient way. And the second point is there is a lot of groups worldwide, what they call community energy groups. Where energy has been organised actually on a community level, and again, to like big data is feeding into that. So the whole electricity sector, not just storage, but the whole electricity sector, is really moving the direction of. Data. And no, but actually, that's going to feed across into the storage sector. That's all. Right. So. We we really we really require microgrid stability. We require telecommunication stability. There is a lot of work which we have to do surely. <laughs> but it was a great discussion, so enlightening, and uh, I'm sure the by the going by the uh, comments of the audience, it was a very bright audience. Thank you very much, audience, and thank you very much uh, the this informed panel, uh, Siddharth. And thank you, Mr. Uh, uh, Pavar. You, Pavan, you've actually pulled it all together and kept it all rolling smoothly and for keeping us all on time. Thank you again so much. Thank you. Thank you very thank much, you. everybody. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Peter. Thank you very much, sirs and ma'am. Uh, our leaders and I have taken home so many nuggets from today's conversation and very well moderated, Mr. Chaudhary. I'm still receiving positive messages from our leaders on email, WhatsApp, and LinkedIn. Thank you very much. And thank you to our leaders in the audience, our members for staying till the end and for sharing excellent questions. We will be taking these discussions on, the, on an exclusive digital professional networking platform, which is curated for leaders. And I've started sending out invitations to select 2,000 leaders across our core sectors, which are energy, immobility, healthcare, and real estate. So whether you would like to engage with us on our expert panel or as learners, our leaders are invited to connect with us for membership to join the energy circle. And uh, all the details are also on the bluecircle.co. So thank you very much once again and uh, are looking forward to more such sessions. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.